If you're British, this film is about you, every one of you. Something is happening in Britain which increasingly intrudes into the way you live. Traditional customs, familiar and trusted patterns of a liberal, compassionate society, the British way of doing things, all are disappearing and being replaced by a frustrating avalanche of alien regulation and bureaucracy. This is happening not as a result of popular demand, but as a result of British membership of the European Union. The very character of our unique way of life is being destroyed, and there has been no public debate, consultation, or approval. The people appearing in this film are not politicians or civil servants. They don't seek your vote or your money. They only ask that for a few moments you watch and listen and then make up your own mind. Almost all you're about to hear has been hidden from you. Everything you're about to hear is the truth. For the last 34 years, British politicians have been hiding from you the fact that they have been handing over the governments of your country to Brussels. This film shows how close they are to completing that process. In 1972, the British people were told that they were joining something called the Common Market. They were assured by Prime Minister Edward Heath that this was just a trading arrangement and involved no loss of essential national sovereignty. In this, the British nation was seriously and deliberately deceived. Today, as a result of that 1972 arrangement, British national identity, a British government and British independence are about to be sacrificed. Britain is to disappear within a European federal state and the British people are to be governed from Brussels by unelected foreign officials. A succession of British politicians have continued that 1972 deceit and secretly stripped Britain of self-government. Details of this whole process have been suppressed and kept from you. Most people in Britain haven't a clue as to what is happening. Christopher Booker explains why. One of the most remarkable things about the European Union is how ignorant people are as to how it came about. A few years ago, when my colleague Richard North and I began researching the history of what is called the European Project, we were astonished to find just how distorted and inaccurate all previous accounts of this story had been. The core ideas which have inspired this project go back to the 1920s, and for the men behind it, notably the Frenchman Jean Monnet, their ultimate goal, right from the start, was to create a United States of Europe. Their aim was to place the peoples of Europe under a form of government like nothing the world had seen before, a government that was supranational. To achieve their goal, they came up with two brilliantly clever ideas. The first was that it could never be achieved overnight. It would have to be assembled piece by piece over many years without revealing its ultimate purpose. The other idea was that all the national governments of Europe should be left in place while being gradually hollowed out from within as they passed under ever greater control by the supranational power. Thus, what amounted to a slow motion coup d'etat could take place without people realizing what was happening. That is why we called our story The Great Deception, because such is what the historical evidence shows it to have been. Step one in the early 1950s was Monet's European Coal and Steel Community. He never intended this body to be anything other than the embryo of what would eventually be a government for Europe. The next step was to widen this into a European Economic Community set up by the Treaty of Rome in 1957. 
Again, this common market was deliberately intended to be just a cover for their true goal of complete political union. For nearly 30 years, the handing over of powers by national governments continued, the original six countries becoming 12, until in the 1980s the project was ready for its next great leap forward. This would need two new treaties, the Single European Act in 1986 and the Maastricht Treaty on European Union in 1992, followed in 1997 and 2001 by two more at Amsterdam and Nice. By now the real aims were coming out ever more into the open, as it was agreed that this new supranational government should have its own currency, its own foreign and defence policies, its own court system and police force, all the attributes of a sovereign state. Finally, as the number of member countries rose to 25, it was agreed that as the next great symbolic act in the story, Europe must have its own constitution. In 2005, as we know, this was rejected by the voters of France and Holland. But by now, the project is so far advanced that those behind it believe it must roll on regardless. As we finally wake up to their real aim, how much longer can the wishes of the people of Europe be ignored? Such is the battle in which today, whether we like it or not, we are all involved. The EU constitution Christopher Booker referred to is a major step in the final transfer of power from Westminster to Brussels. But it's more than that. It will mean imposing on the British people a continental view of freedom where nothing is allowed unless the law says so. In Britain, we are free-born from the moment of our birth able to do anything unless the law prohibits. In the European Union, we are about to lose that. Britain already has a constitution of its own, one that has stood the test of time and been admired and copied by other countries, in particular America, whose founding fathers used the British model when drafting their own constitution. Is it so important that we retain our own constitution? What's so special about it? Here's John Bingley. A constitution should define the relationship between the governance of a nation and its people, setting limitations on power and providing the people with safeguards that protect them by securing the means of redress and remedy. We most certainly do have a British constitution and it does just that. Our constitution has evolved over many centuries and consists of much written law. The best known examples are the Magna Carta in 1215 and the Declaration and Bill of Rights of 1688-9. In Britain we are governed according to the rule of law. The rules contained in our constitution define how we must be governed. Primarily the coronation oath stipulates the rule of law as the only means of our lawful governance and places limitations on the use of executive power. Those limitations stop the divine right of kings. There ought to be no divine right of politicians either. In short, the British Constitution and the rule of law provide a framework for government by creating boundaries and constraints on the exercise of power. Dictatorial power can only come about when the ruler has both the power to make the law and to enforce it. Mussolini, Hitler and Stalin all achieved this total authority, resulting in staggering bloodshed. Our unique British constitution prevents such unification of power taking place and places limitations on the use of executive power. Those limitations stop the divine right of kings. There ought to be no divine right of politicians either. In short, the British constitution and the rule of law provide a framework for government by creating boundaries and constraints on the exercise of power.